Tonight we are going to look at a passage from Leviticus. It's not a book of the Bible that we often turn to, but it's still a part of the Bible, and so we should still consider it as such. Leviticus chapter 10, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and I'm going to read the first seven verses. It says, Aaron's sons, Nadab Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. Moses summoned Mishael and Ilisphan, sons of Aaron's uncle Azil, and said to them, Come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp, as Moses ordered. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ithmar, Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, all the house of Israel, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting or you will die because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. So they did as Moses said. The sermon series that we're going through is on the unpleasant or sometimes shocking stories of the Bible. Why is God putting this in his word? What is he trying to tell us? It's got to be in there for a reason. God doesn't do things arbitrarily. So what is God trying to tell us with these odd stories like this? But there's good news even in these shocking stories. There's good news even in these stories. And so it's our business to look into that. So first, what happened? What happened? We have Aaron's sons, he has four, and there's Nadab and Abihu, they're the two oldest, and they go and offer what the Bible says is unauthorized fire to God in verse 1. They go and offer unauthorized fire to God. Now, if you look back at the previous chapters, God had just given all of his instructions as to what worship of him is supposed to do, what it's supposed to be like. And so he had just explained everything that was supposed to happen. Oh no, we'll be running into that problem again. We'll figure that out one of these days. Anyways, uh, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu offer unauthorized fire to God. That's what you're supposed to write down. Offer unauthorized fire to God. And the Hebrew from for unauthorized is vague. The Hebrew for unauthorized is vague. It's really not specified exactly what went wrong or what they did that was wrong. It wasn't like, as God said, they went and such and such, they went against this. It wasn't like that. It just says that they offered something that wasn't right. So, their sin is not specified, really, explicitly. It's, so, it's not the point of the story. Their sin is not specified. That's not the point of the story. Must have been, it's deliberately vague. 
So Nadab and Abihu are consumed by fire from the Lord in verse 2. They offer unauthorized incense to God. And I'll try to paint a picture for you. If this is the tabernacle here, there's certain, there are certain places where only certain people can go. And so there's the holy place, and then there's this one part of it, and that's called the most holy place. And there's a curtain in front of it. And that's where God's presence is supposed to be. In that most holy place. And only one priest, the high priest, could enter that place. And only once a year on one of their holidays. And there were all these rituals that this, even this high priest had to go through to get past that curtain. The incense... There's a, an altar of incense. It says they, were, they took their censers and put incense in them. The altar of incense is right in front of that curtain. It's right in front of that curtain. So they were very near the place where God was directly. And maybe they were even intending to go on the other side of the curtain. We don't know. That's not specified. But... The altar of incense was right next to that most holy place. And so they are consumed by fire from the Lord. They are consumed by fire from the Lord. That's what you need to write down. And just a couple verses before, it says that God had consumed the sacrifices that they offered. Just a couple verses before, God had consumed the sacrifices. That might not mean a whole lot to us, but that meant to them that God was pleased with them. Now that God has killed some of Aaron's, Aaron's two oldest sons, that's a sign of disfavor. That's not good. We're on bad terms with God. We gotta, this, is, this is not right. And something, I don't know if you caught it or not, but it says on there that they were still in their tunics in verse 5. They were still in their tunics. Now, their tunics were still on them, so this was no ordinary fire, but the effects of God's holiness. I'll say that a couple more times. Their tunics were still on them. This was no ordinary fire, but the effects of God's holiness. So apparently this fire, it burned them up, but it didn't burn up the clothes that they were wearing. So this is not just any kind of fire. This is... This is God's holiness. And they were disintegrated, still in their clothes, somehow. And then Moses comes in. And Moses, you know, what we might think is kind of a little insensitive, Moses explains that this is what happens when priests don't respect the holiness of God. This is what happens when the priests don't respect God's holiness. It's almost a, I told you so. So Aaron's sons had just died, and he comes up to Aaron and and says, I told you so. Seems a little insensitive to maybe our ears in verse 3. But it's a little different than that. Moses is essentially saying, the closer that you get to God, the more attention you need to pay to Him. The closer that you get to God, the more closely you need to pay attention to who He is. And they were negligent there. A little bit ago we just sang, they'll know we are Christians by our love. God is revealed in his people. 
you and I reveal God wherever we go. And leaders especially are called to a higher standard than the rest. God is seen in the activity in the daily lives of his people. That's you and me. And if you are a leader, and not, not, just, not just a pastor, not just elders or deacons, but if you're a parent, even, or a grandparent, or a teacher, Sunday school teacher, or cadet leader, gems leader, if you are a leader, then you are held to a higher standard. So Nadab and Abihu, their corpses are taken outside the camp where unholy things go, in verses 4 and 5. It says, it, it specifies that they were taken outside the camp. So they were basically treated as waste. They had done an unholy thing, and so they are to be taken outside the camp. Essentially, that means that they were cursed. That they were rejected by God. And then Aaron and his younger two sons, on top of all of this, are told not to mourn for their dead brothers, but everyone else could mourn. So Aaron and his two younger sons, they just lost the two older sons. And then they're told, you can't mourn for them. Which is what is talking about by saying, don't let your hair get in disorder and don't tear your clothes or you will die. If you go through the mourning rituals, then you will die. Everyone else is supposed to mourn the loss, but not you. That seems a little strange, doesn't it? Maybe that seems a little harsh. What is behind that, though, is that if Aaron and his sons were to mourn their, the deaths of their brothers and sons, mourning would suggest disapproval of God's actions. And loyalty to God comes before anyone else. As leaders, they were in a particular position. And so, if they went through the mourning rituals, it would suggest that they didn't agree with God. Or that these, the sons and the brothers, that they were, they, it shouldn't have happened to them. And God comes before anyone else. And you don't have to look far in the Bible to find that kind of message. Jesus said, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. It's a really strong words. God's saying, I've got to be everything, number one, or nothing at all. I can't be number two in your life. So where is Christ and where is grace in this story? The whole Old Testament is supposed to point ahead to Christ and Christ is supposed to be revealed in all of the Old Testament. Where is Christ here? Well, let's start out by saying one thing. God's holiness is a big deal. God's holiness is a big deal. Psalm 96, verse 9. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. There's something about God being so perfect that it would make us tremble. 
And we can say all we want. I want the Lord. We want to be nearer to him and to love him and so forth. But in reality, you can't handle the Lord. We can say, I want the Lord, but you can't handle the Lord. This is what happens if you try to approach the Lord just any old way. You're burned up in your own clothes. So sinful humans can't survive God's holiness. Sinful human beings can't survive God's holiness. And God says exactly that to Moses. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And I don't think God's saying that because he's he's being mean. He's saying that because you're sinful. And you can't survive. You can't handle it. And so, again, I mentioned this a couple Sundays ago, I think. God is not safe by any means. He is holy and He is good. But He is not safe. He's not safe. Even just... Seeing him is too much for us. If we, John Calvin said this, I thought it was a good insight into this passage. If we consider how holy it is to worship God, then the enormity of the punishment here in this passage will by no means offend us. If we consider how great God is and what his holiness means, then this punishment would not be offensive to us. Now, we might like to think that we're good enough for God, but in reality, only Jesus Christ is good enough. We would like to think that we're good enough for God. But in reality, only Jesus Christ is good enough. For us to approach God, it wouldn't work. Now we do good deeds and show that we're Christians by our love when we're thinking about it. And, and you know, we'll do some nice things for people and we'll go to church and and, you know, do the, what Christians are supposed to do and everything, and we'll think, yeah, we're pretty good. That's not, that doesn't have anything to do with it. We are sinful, mortal people. Instead of approaching God with God's holy salvation, Aaron's sons approached God with their own salvation. What happened is that they were supposed to burn incense with coals of fire from the altar in the tabernacle. What probably happened is that they probably didn't get their coals from God's tabernacle. They probably got them from their breakfast fire or something that day. Instead of bringing God, God's holiness and righteousness with them, they brought their own. And that goes for us too. What then shall we say, it says in Romans 9, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel who pursued a law of righteousness has not attained it, Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. So, if we 
presume to think that, oh, any old coals will do. If we presume to think any old good deeds and, you know, Christian behavior will be good enough, then we are badly mistaken. Only humble sinners who call on Jesus Christ can presume to approach God. Only humble sinners who call on Jesus Christ for their salvation can presume to approach God. So if you or I were to stand before God on that last day and we were to give Him a list of all of the good things that we did, you know, God, I was involved in my church here and and I went twice every Sunday and I never missed a day of Sunday school and, and then when I got old enough I taught Sunday school and I led gems and cadets and, and I was a, a deacon and an elder and I did all of these things. I, I volunteered at love and, and so, yeah. So I, I, I was really, I did really good. That would be what like Aaron's sons did. Look at how good I am. Instead of that, we need to be humble sin- sinners, humble, sinful people who have no presumptions about what it means to approach God. It's a big deal. Which leads to the next point. We have no idea how amazing it is to belong to Jesus Christ. We can't scratch the surface of how much that means. When Christ died on the cross, it says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. That was the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. The place where only one person could go on one day of the year. And suddenly that curtain was torn. And it was because of Christ that that happened. And that altar of incense was right before that curtain. So, for you and I, We can enter the most holy place. It's not just for, say, me on a Christmas day once a year after I go through all of these purifying rituals. Any one of us can go to that most holy place. The place where it's so dangerous that we would get burned up. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. He is it. We can approach God's holy throne with confidence even. We don't even have to go in there sneaking and trembling. and <laughs> No, we can walk in there boldly. We can hold our head high and march right in there. Hebrews 4.16 says exactly that. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just like we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. By belonging to Christ, we can enter that dangerous sacred, holy place and be perfectly fine. We can even do so with our head held high. We can speak to God directly and call Him our Father. There's no other religion in the world where you can do that. All of the other religions of the world, God is not your Father. God's too good for you. Jesus said, no, call him 
our Father who art in heaven, when he taught his disciples to pray. Galatians 4 verse 6, When the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. We're, we're children of God. So just like we would walk up to our own dads to ask for something that we need, we can walk right into God's presence directly and ask for something that we need and talk to him. We don't have to worry about being good enough because Christ is good enough. We don't have a bar that we have to reach. There's no certain criteria that we have to meet. There's not a certain amount of good deeds that we have to do. We don't have to say a certain amount of Hail Marys in order to be good enough for God. That criteria has already been met. Christ is good enough, and that's good enough for us. Romans 10, 3 and 4. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So if you believe in Christ, then you have his righteousness. And the last point, we are his, God's adopted children And we are loved as much as God's Son. We are adopted children of God. And we are loved as much as the Son Himself. In fact, we are heirs. Everything that He owns, we are going to share with Him. Ephesians 1, 5 verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. And a verse that I really like. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Jesus Christ is our salvation. Because of him, we can approach God in prayer. Let's do that right now. Our Father in heaven, Lord, it's it's something that we don't understand completely. What a privilege it is that we can talk to you directly and be in your presence without fear. Rather, we can be here and talk to you boldly. Lord, help us to understand that. We pray that that would sink in to us that it would sink into our minds and our hearts, that it would change us. Lord, that we would be transformed and that we would show the love of Christ, the love that he showed us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.